Hey, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, my name is Ed Friedman. I'm the chairman of Friends of Marimini Bay, and uh, welcome to the first event of our 25th year of doing a winter speaker series. And uh, the second time we've tried this via Zoom, we had an abbreviated version last year as we dealt with COVID and eased back into some of our regular programming. So we've got the full season here this year, as probably most of you know. And um, going to tell you, uh, spend a couple of minutes uh, on Friends of Mary Mini Bay, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, the program is going to take about 45 minutes or so. And uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat room. Um, I don't really know how to do that, but everyone else does probably. And uh, uh, we will field those at the end. Um, so Friends of Mary Mini Bay, uh, you can see on the slide, we, we are actually a very unique organization in that we we work in all of these four disciplines here, and we try to let our, um, you know, our, our well, well uh, executed research inform our advocacy. And that advocacy can be uh, very strong at time. We are a land trust, and we have an active education program, which was a lot more active uh, before COVID. But having said that, we just uh, today. Um, sponsored a, uh, a live theater presentation, which was outside, which was awesome. Bowdenham Elementary School, a program from the PT Theater down in Massachusetts uh, called To Be or Not To Be, B as in B-E-E, -E, about threats to pollinators. And uh, we're doing that again tomorrow at a different elementary school, uh, thanks to a grant from the um, uh, New England Arts Foundation. So. So as I mentioned, research, uh, a few of the things that we, you know, we've done over the years here, multi-year circulation study of the bay using uh, drifters with GPS units in them and uh, radio beacons so we could relocate them and redeploy them. Um, many years worth of looking at land use changes and vegetation changes over time, uh, using aerial photography and converting it to GIS, using caged mussels to biomonitor and localized PCB hotspots discharging into the bay and also to tell whether or not uh, pulp mills were still discharging dioxin after a, a process change and et cetera, et cetera. We do a lot of archaeology digs, which has been great to say research informs our advocacy. And uh, we do a lot with fish passage issues, uh, toxins over the years. Uh, right now, we've got a lawsuit going against Central Maine Power over a combination of nuisance lighting, tower lighting, and uh, nuisance uh, radio frequency radiation coming from a radar unit they installed. So we have, um, we filed endangered, a couple of endangered species suits over the years, uh, one of which got the uh, St. Croix River reopened to alewives after the legislature had shut it back in 1995, got the Atlantic salmon listed, um, uh, as an endangered species up in, in this area. So uh, again, you used to be a way more active education program in school and a couple of outdoor programs. And we've protected probably now over 1500 acres or so around the Bay, focusing on valuable wildlife habitat. Um, if you missed <clears throat> tonight's uh, presentation, we've got a friend who, if you're here, you didn't miss it. If you've got a friend who wants to see it, or if you want to see some older ones, we've been recording these for quite a while. Um, you can go to our homepage on the website, uh, fomb.org or friendsofmarybinibay.org and scroll down on the right side and under education, you'll see all the speaker stuff. So there's a, a speaker series video list, there's bio information on the present speakers, uh, and there's a calendar and there's a longer list going back to 25 years of who we have had here. And this is a look at just the season's presentations coming, coming up. So you'll see, uh, for those of you who have been around for a while, in 2012, we actually had Captain Paul Watson, who, who heads the organization Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, known for getting in the way of whalers down in the, in the Antarctic uh, uh, ocean, the South, Southern Ocean. And we had Paul here just about a few weeks before he got arrested in Germany 
on an outstanding warrant uh, issued from Costa Rica. So um, uh, Sea Shepherd is going to be back, uh, not not Paul, but um, uh, Tamara Aronovich, uh, communication director, tell you what they've been doing since um, since Paul got uh, arrested and released back then, and a number of other great presentations here, and uh, <clears throat> let Roger carry on. But um, I thank you all again for coming and hope you can join us uh, at our other events as well. So Roger, you've got the screen now. You snatched it, you snatched it away and uh, you can, you can uh, do your share screen. There you go. See it, okay. Um, thank you, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I could do 10 presentations on uh, Sebago Lake and the Presumpscot River, so I won't even, um, Really, you better better stay away from that tonight. But uh, this uh, uh, this presentation is uh, wants to promote a discussion of the impacts of Arctic mega dams, and it's also a, a tribute to the late Hans Noy and uh, those who really risked their lives and careers and sacrifice to inform and to warn us about how Arctic mega dams are driving climate change and devastating marine ecosystems. This is a uh, a dam in Russia, I'll just call it the Cyano. Uh, one of the, and the questions, don't ask me to pronounce these dams, but uh, it, it, I just want you to notice the penstock tubes on the, the face of the dam. Um, there's about, about 10 of them. Um, uh, was, is a tribute to him and uh, you know, how these da dams are, are driving climate change. Um, uh, this dam, notice the penstock tubes. Um, each, uh, each penstock tube, 636 feet high, has the capacity to deliver enough water to produce, produce about the same megawatts as all the hydro dams in Maine combined. Therefore, about each mega dam in Russia and Canada can produce about seven to 10 times the megawatts as all the dams in Maine. Uh, that's, that's a big dam. So what's been going on with uh, mega dam building? Well, you, in this chart from Arctic Blue Deserts, you can see that uh, in three decades, really, it, uh, there was a boom of building, 70s, 80s, and, and 90s. And uh, this is uh, kind of when things started to happen, <laughs> you know, in the uh, environment in the Arctic, it was noticed. Of course, you know, fossil fuels is blamed. We're not saying that fossil fuels isn't doing it. It's just there's, uh, you know, is there a synergistic effect? Um, are they amplifying each other? Um, we, we, that's, that's for, for the discussion. Um, the, uh, this cover of this, uh, study, uh, thanks to, uh, our intern, uh, Karen, you mentioned, uh, was, was recovered. It's a, um, a study on the mixing and circulation in the Gulf of St. Lawrence estuary up to 1964. It's dated 1970. It's an abbreviated version of the unpublished 1964 study. Uh, and it, it wasn't allowed to be released until the Manic Dam was completed, uh, a la 1970. Uh, because of this, uh, the data that Noy found about circulation, how important freshwater flows were to circulation and realizing what would happen and what already the dams that had been built in the uh, further up in the St. Lawrence estuary uh, had, had done uh, to, the, to the climate, uh, et cetera. Uh, he kind of had a Houston, we have a problem moment. Uh, he had some early recognition of the hydropower impacts and its connections. Um, Noy could see the big picture, which a lot of scientists uh, you know, have, I, I believe, uh, don't, don't do this. Um, he was an amazing oceanographer. Uh, he could see this Arctic sea ice disappearance, the weakening of global ocean currents, um, Greenland glacial melting and sea level rise, warming coastal seas, and increasing intensity of, of weather events. Uh, about Hans Noy, he was German born and trained as an engineer and oceanographer. Uh, he uh, immigrated to Canada with his wife after World War II. Uh, he worked for the Natural Resource Council of Canada for 10 years. 
starting in 1955, then the Bedford Institute of Oceanography for 20 years until 1984. He uh, published three pioneering papers that spoke to his knowledge of large dam and flow regulation impacts. Uh, they were runoff regulation for hydropower and its effect on the ocean environment. That was 1976. And the man-made storage of water resources, a liability to the ocean environments, uh, part one and two. Um, he was also, his uh, warnings were cited in books like Silence Rivers and the Ecology and Politics of Large Dams. Um, thanks to uh, Arctic Blue Deserts, uh, <laughs> We're uh, grateful that we have, it's, a, it's, a, it's like an encyclopedia of information for, uh, about the, on the impacts of, uh, of these dams. The Arctic Blue Desert is, is a tribute to the late Hans Noy, and Steve Kasperzak, the author, has reinforced the warnings of Noy and provided new infra information that corroborates his hypothesis and predictions. This book uh, allows us to understand the complexities and oceanographic principles uh, and why Noe became so adamant in his warnings uh, about the rise of the Megadam age. Now this study took place, uh, of course, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It was a big study, it used uh, some good sized ships, <laughs> a lot of uh, uh, you know, buoys, uh, underwater buoys to do measuring. It was a lot of money. Um, shows uh, you, the Manic Five Reservoir, an arrow to it up there. There's an old meteor crater that is filled. Uh, you see where the Manicougan River estuary enters and where Point de Monts is, where he did uh, a lot of his uh, data collecting. Um, you know, the Daniel Johnson Dam, Manic Five, is uh, the biggest dam, was well, one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and then uh, you have the Manicougan on the, in the lower photo, you know, in its natural state, uh, but no more. That's totally damned. Um, before the Manicougan dams, in a few days, water could flow from the mountains to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Now, thanks to dams, these, the water takes eight years to fully circulate down the same distance. The thermal regime and chemistry of the fresh water entering the Gulf of St. Lawrence are greatly altered by this stagnation in the mega dam reservoirs. Now, this is a cross section a, a Noy did in a study and it's been enhanced by ABD, Ar Arctic Blue Deserts. Um, it's, the river's totally dammed, but you look at the size and the amount of water in it, um, Manic Five Reservoir is, has equivalent to 27 Moosehead Lakes. And the live storage uh, flow of about 34 cubic kilometers are shifted from spring to winter from Manic Five. That is flow regulation. Now, another sketch by uh, Noy that's been enhanced uh, is probably one of the more important ones to understand. Uh, the fresh water of the rivers of the entering in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, including what would have been the Manicougan, uh, flows on the south side of the St. Lawrence, uh, the estuary and Gulf. It, uh, the, the fresh water is lighter, um, so it rides on top, but there's a, through various scientific laws and principles, it causes salt water from the Atlantic Ocean to flow inward uh, up, up the estuary. Um, I call this the Noy effect. Um, he, Noy measured that at Point de Mont, there was a one to 15 ratio of, of fresh water going out to salt water coming in. This is very important to uh, sea life and, and uh, just circulation and oxygenation. Now, so you get an idea of size of flow. Uh, here's a photo of Niagara Falls. We all know about Niagara Falls. The uh, average annual flow, 85,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, now, the, for size, the Kennebec River is nine, about 9,100 cubic feet per second discharge 
into Mary Meeting Bay. So Niagara, that's a good amount of water. Um, we'll call it a, a big, uh, big faucet, big tap, water tap. Um, now, this is a uh, diagram from actually from Noy's 1976 paper. And he, he shows uh, a, a graph, a chart of the natural spring pulse that used to occur in the Manicougan River. Um, this spring freshet runoff was, was huge. If you look at that, remember that picture of the Manicougan 1919 I showed? You know, you, you can see how uh, the, the bare rock, I mean, the whole, the whole river basin is, most of it, what you see is bare rock. Well, that's full uh, during the spring freshet. Um, and, uh, you know, Manicougan is considered a small river uh, in, in Canada. Now, you'll see the dark line now uh, down here is the new regula regulated flow. Notice in this river, it's actually higher in winter than in the uh, times it would normally be uh, a great spring runoff uh, because of the storage at Manic 5. So uh, thanks to in, in Arctic blue deserts, uh, we, we can have 1.5 times the flow of Niagara Falls per second per day during the peak of the spring freshet is stopped and stored in the Manicougan reservoirs. So that's, that's what it takes to wipe out the natural hydrologic cycle of this river. Hope <laughs> you can ask questions again about this. It took took me a long time to get some of this stuff. Here's a larger map of the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the uh, you know the, the Atlantic Ocean. You see the Gulf of Maine, the Grand Banks. You have the the blue water. Uh, I mean the blue arrows. <laughs> of course, the water blue. The blue uh, arrows is the fresh water going out. Now it, did, it didn't go straight out. It it, it curls down. Uh, towards the Gulf of Maine, it goes out to Grand Banks. Um, uh, you have the, the purple arrows are really, you have fresh water, uh, low salinity water coming down from Hudson Bay and uh, in, the, in the Labrador current. Um, so there's a, a lot of circulation, but it's, it's been greatly reduced. The ones, the rivers in Hudson Bay uh, are regulated. Uh, the, uh, the flow to the, is, you know, the discussion is the flow to the Gulf of Maine weaker. Uh, we know that all the rivers in Maine are highly regulated. So they really, we really don't, uh, there isn't really much on that as to how that's, uh, how that's been impacted. Although we've, we begged FERC to, to study it, but they wouldn't, uh, said we were the only ones asking, so they wouldn't do it. Um, but this, uh, this noise effect uh, is gone because the one to 15 volume ratio was in 1964. And uh, as you remember from that chart, so many uh, more dams have been built in the St. Lawrence region. So that, that uh, ratio is, is much reduced. And we would expect that, uh, you know, you get anox anoxia problems like in the, might get in the Gulf, deep down in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, this happens in other places in the world that uh, smaller areas especially uh, become agnox, agnox, agnoxic. So smaller seas and big estuaries or uh, gulfs become uh, anoxic. So, uh, okay, let's switch to Russia, um, over to Russia. There's a lot of big dams in Russia. Um, you know, there's uh, got the, the Angara, which is part of the Yenisei, uh, the Ob, big dams there, a lot of other dams, and uh, the Coma River, way in the west, has, is a, another big dam. Uh, you know, these, these rivers barely flowed in the, in the, uh, in the winter. You know, they were iced up. Now they have uh, fresh water, un, uh, unfrozen water flows. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, evaporation, uh, heat pollution of the atmosphere and the land. 
um, all kinds of impacts. And I was just gonna say again, each of these Russian dams produce about seven to 10 times the megawatts of all the hydro dams in Maine. Uh, here's a aerial of uh, space aerial of the Yenisei River and Ob River estuaries. Now, all these dams would do the same thing uh, with, with the Noy effect uh, ratio. Uh, they would reduce it. But uh, one of the things that uh, happens now, you have this higher winter flow, the, the Noy effect goes into, into place here because that, that flow still drives warm uh, ocean water um, up into the estuary and that uh, reduces the uh, uh, sea ice formation and uh, melts it from the bottom. Uh, well, uh, at least, you know, this, this needs to be discussed. <laughs> um, now the estimated pulse energy and volume of 26 Niagara Falls flowing for each second of every day for the month of June never reaches the Kara Sea in the spring as it once did through uh, geologic Arctic Ocean history. I'll say more recent eras, but because uh, the Arctic didn't exist really in, in that form till then. Um, but, um, you know, this was the ice factory of the uh, Arctic, that and the Laptev Sea next door. Um, so, you know, you're messing with this, uh, <laughs> A lot of sea ice, let me put it that way. Now, has it ever been noticed? Well, you know, just checking around uh, newspapers.com, places like that, found this uh, article and others, uh, especially back in the 70s and early 80s, talking about that. After, after that, uh, the media went radio silent on this stuff. Um, huge man made lakes warming up Siberia. Well, let's go to some of the excerpts. Um, we used to have winter temperatures as low as minus 67 degrees around here. Now it's a rare day on which the thermometer drops to 40 below zero. An official of a Siberian city. These, I, I, I talked with one uh, reporter who actually did one of the stories and uh, he said, uh, uh, we never used names of officials or scientists because we didn't want them to go to a gulag. So that was kind of, uh, you know, how, how they operated out the, the, the journalists. In, okay, in effect, what the Russians have done in their drive to industrialize Siberia and exploit its enormous wealth of raw materials is to create inland oceans, which account for more humidity, more rain, less seasonal fluctuation in temperatures and more frequent change in the weather. Now, Keep in mind, this is the, the region where the Siberia, Sub, Siberian high is formed in the, in, the, in the fall and the winter. And that drives our, uh, has a lot to do with our North American climate. So uh, for discussion, what's, what's it doing to the Siberian high when you have all this going on? Uh, whatever their feelings about it, however, and regardless of the potential ecological impact, Siberians are gonna have a, to accustom themselves to Siberia getting warmer and warmer. Yeah, more dams are being built. And a party official for the Irkutsk Oblast, a region of about 300 square miles, bigger than Texas, recently estimated that average winter temperatures in the province are now from six to 10 degrees higher than they were before completion of the dam. And the vast 365 mile long, 1.4 million acre lake that is formed behind it. I think the, you know, you can, believe, uh, I don't know if they exaggerate, but uh, it certainly is corroborated by other, other articles. I'll switch to uh, albedo. We need to understand albedo. It's a reflectivity of sunlight. Um, you have new snow reflects about 90% of the sun's energy back into space. You lose that sea ice. You have uh, open water, you only reflect 7% and that heat is absorbed by the earth, essentially. Uh, so that sea ice is pretty important for uh, keeping the planet cool. Okay, now there's this Russian geographer, one of the better known uh, Russians, uh, Peter Borisov. Uh, 
he, he had planned to uh, change the climate of Siberia. It meant changing, uh, building dams and uh, really a sort of a diverting the Bering Strait waters. And uh, he wrote in his book, uh, the ocean is of all the natural surfaces of the earth, the best absorber of solar radiation. But the same surface in another state, snow and ice, is the best reflector. Although the temperature range on the surface of the ocean and the ground layer of the atmosphere is small, the water changes its state quite often and fast within this small range. This changeability sharply affects the climate. So true. Um, no. Lastly, the north of the Atlantic Basin may be compared to a bathtub in which cold water is poured from two taps, the Labrador and East Greenland currents, and then warm water, the Gulf Stream, through another. By regulating the taps, we can change the thermal balance of the Atlantic and with it the climate of the surrounding continents. The recognition of the import role of the ocean currents in forming the client, climate, in forming the climate has determined regional improvements of the climatic re regime since the end of the last century by ch changing the direction of the warm and cold currents. At the same time, we have devised to regulate and transfer the river runoff. They had big plans. Now, I think that uh, diverting, that uh, change of winter summer flow, uh, 26 Niagara Falls, just on those two rivers, that, that's a big, uh, change a, a turn of the tap <laughs> and it's not, uh, no one's talking about it. Our Arctic sea ice minimum area, boy, it's, uh, it's going down, especially since those three decades where the dam building went crazy. Uh, kind of like uh, Noy predicted. So what's going on in the Arctic? Now these are new articles and uh, you know, has you know, climate's controlled by how much solar energy is absorbed by the Earth and uh, and lost to outer space. Um, there's a growing Earth energy imbalance called EEI. Now, in this uh, article by Norman Loeb, uh, they're, they're about uh, the market increase in Earth's heating rate. They, this quote uh, that EEI is due to decreased reflection of energy back into space by clouds and sea ice and increases in well-mixed greenhouse gases and water vapor. Uh, so that imbalance is caused by that. Uh, in the, it, it, Patrick Lynch is quoted uh, in this article that says, Arctic is absorbing more sunlight. Since the year 2000, the rate at which the Arctic absorbs solar radiation in June, July, and August has increased by 5%, said Norman Loeb principal investigator and a climate scientist at NASA's Langley Research Center. While a 5% increase might not seem like much, consider that the global rate has remained essentially flat during the same time. Well, that's eyebrow raising. Okay, no other region on earth shows a trend of change. You know, the key factors mentioned in this report are more clouds, loss of albedo, more water vapor. I can't help thinking about that humidity uh, word in that article that, uh, that all those Russians noticed. Uh, uh, anyway, so let's go to uh, uh, more of this. That Now in uh, Washington Post article, the earth is trapping an impressive amount of heat, uh, NASA says, uh, there's quote, that imbalance roughly doubled between 2005 and 2019 the study found. It's a massive amount of energy, said Gregory Johnson, an oceanographer for NOAA's uh, for Pacific Marine Laboratory and co-author of the study. Johnson said the energy increase is equivalent to four detonations per second of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, or every person on Earth using 20 electric tea kettles at once. It's such a hard number to get your mind around. Now that's all from the uh, you know, they're saying the sea ice melting. Well, of course, the snow cover on the, on the land uh, is, is uh, less. Uh, but uh, that's scary. But, you know, did the, for discussion, you know, with, did the mega dams uh, sort of trigger the melting of the sea ice? 
because now it's amplifying. Uh, doesn't seem to be stoppable. Okay. Um, let's, oops. Let's go, let me go back to. Uh, Got to go back to the the biosphere. We've talked about the cryosphere and the atmosphere and hydrosphere. Let's. Um, what's happening to the the biosphere? It has been uh, been estimated uh, that the present conditions. Um, well, I'm sorry, this is from Noy, one of the quotes from Noy. I'm going to start with that because he gave us the first warnings. It has been estimated that under present conditions, the spring and summer runoff at the entrance to the Gulf of St. Lawrence has been reduced by between one third and one half. Uh, this drastic alteration of the natural runoff has caused significant changes in the physics and dynamics of the waters of the estuary, Gulf, and adjacent coastal region. It is argued that such modifications produce a profound impact on the biological balance of the whole ecosystem, as well as changes in the seasonal heat budget. Uh, also uh, in 1982, he said, a particular concern is the increased development of hydropower under construction or in the design stage in Labrador and Gavi Bay, James Bay and Hudson Bay, which are bound to threaten the product productivity of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. Here's a warning. Uh, pictures the Barrasso Dam. Talk about a mega dam there. Um, Upper Churchill Falls. Um, that's right close to the uh, the, the Atlantic. Uh, these are all uh, all these new mega dams. Uh, he wasn't the only one. No, he wasn't the only one uh, preaching uh, about this. Michael Rosengert uh, was a uh, scientist, a fishery scientist in 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 Russia. He had to leave about 1980 because. Uh, he would have been thrown in a gulag because um, he was adamant that uh, all these dams and the river regulation were, had destroyed the, the Soviet fisheries, um, especially in the in southern Russia. Um, but he he did because uh, that's where he did his work. The spring river runoff. Okay, here's a graph. You see it at the top. As it goes down by percentage, you'll see it affects estuarine estuarine salinity organic matter, uh, detention time of water, the stagnation, and the pollution times, because uh, pollution is magnified when uh, the runoff is decreased. And lastly, at the bottom, the fish catch uh, drops off dramatically if the spring runoff is, is reduced. Now, you know, summarizing Michael Ro Rosengert's explanation of the impacts, um, you know, he, he was, uh, he, in summary, he said the reduction of the sp river spring freshet by 40 to 60%, especially in consecutive years, is devastating to the coastal fishery. Uh, Rosengert explained that when you take 60% of the natural spring flow, the lifeblood of the river ecosystem is gone. He said, it's as if you drain the blood from my body and expected me to go on living. Well, this is happening in uh, uh, rivers in Maine. It's, it's uh, definitely happening in these mega dam rivers. It's not surprising our fisheries in the ocean uh, are, are hurting so badly. We'll go to uh, one of the most important plants in the, in the ocean. Uh, D dams and their flow regulation are adversarial to marine diatoms, exclamation point. You know, diatoms are the most important foundation of the marine food chain and are one of nature's most powerful biological cooling mechanisms for global climate. How can that be? All right, well, um, <laughs> I found this, uh, I've seen it a few times, I had to put it in here. Uh, in Isaiah 46, it says, uh, uh, all flesh is grass. Well, the late Boswick Ketchum, a microbiologist at the Woods Hole uh, Institute, revised Isaiah 46 to explain why diatoms are the, the gold foundation of the marine food chain. He said, all fish is diatom. If you want high quality fish, uh, it came from uh, the diatom food chain. Now, diatom information, uh, important to know that diatoms need silica. They have a requirement for it. Uh, 
fact, they take in 6.7 billion metric tons of silica annually. If the ocean gets lower, uh, they don't do well. <laughs> the, they provide 20, 25% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. They're sensitive to timing and volume of freshwater flow. Um, the, they have a high responsibility for the silica pump that sequesters carbon in the ocean depths. And this is what cools the planet. They, you get rid of this, the, uh, the CO2 is taken in and, and converted to oxygen and carbon, you get rid of that carbon, it's gone, it's sequestered. Of course, I think it's, it's known as oil now in, in the geologic terms, but uh, you know, they're, they're responsible for about one fourth of the primary production on the planet Earth. And of course, half the carbon flux to the deep ocean. Rivers, rivers now are important because they deliver 80% of available silica to diatoms, while ocean current upwellings provide a substantial volume. But if you reduce your ocean currents, you lose that volume too. Marine diatoms dominate other phytoplankton in a nutrient-rich, well-mixed ocean surface layer. And uh, through geologic history, they, they are a natural uh, mechanism that has helped cool the climate. Uh, Silica, silica availability controls diatom populations, which determine atmospheric CO2 levels. That's an important concept to uh, gather here. Okay, um, here's a picture of uh, the diatoms in the Barents Sea. Uh, you can see them from outer space. Um, dams and flow regulation diminish diatom populations by they disrupt the volume and timing of the delivering of nutrients, altering the coastal water temperature and salinity, dampening ocean upwelling current energy, and reducing the mixing of surface layers, which results in increased stratification. Um, Noy said it was like uh, river regulation is like uh, watering and fertilizing the winter and doing nothing in the summer and expecting your plants to grow. Well, that's, that's kind of what's going on uh, to the diatoms. Uh, Non-diatom phytoplankton dominate when ocean layers are stratified. Uh, and now, a NASA study says that the diatom populations in a 14 year period since 1998 have been falling 1% per year. Well, that's, that's scary. I think there needs to be a discussion about uh, you know, what's happening and, and how these mega dams are a player in that decline. You look at, uh, the, the uh, links, the relationships of diatoms. Uh, diatoms uh, feed copepods. Uh, Calanus finmarchicus is a very important copepod in the Gulf of Maine. It's important for the right whale. That's their main food. Uh, if their, their population, if, if diatom populations are diminished, copepods are diminished. Um, in addition, uh, the flow regulations changes the uh, lateral movements of, uh, of the copepod larvae and uh, changes their location. Um, diatoms suppress harmful algal blooms, but we've getting, since, since according to uh, some reports, uh, the increased numbers and intensity of harmful algal blooms has been occurring like in the Gulf of Maine. Um, it's been no discussion of really why, uh, but uh, copepods eat the, or consume the harmful algae, algae and uh, doesn't really bother them. But then the whales, right whales come along, consume them and it can cause, uh, you know, loss of weight and reproductive uh, uh, problems. So it's, uh, it's another impact uh, that's happening. Now, Atlantic cod, uh, you know, <laughs> They're, uh, of course, they're going to be hurt by a, a loss of diatoms, and uh, we want to talk about them because uh, they really crashed, and uh, you can see that um, in this graph. Um, now, there'd always been overfishing. There'd be moratoriums, and they'd come back, there was especially overfishing in the 60s, uh, in the 70s, and then there was a moratorium, and it came back, and about... Uh, about right when uh, Hans Noy warned there would be a crash when those dams, when the Hudson Bay dams came online, uh, it crashed and uh, it's, it stayed, it has relatively stayed crashed along with other, other species. So they're, you know, but the mega dams have been left out of the, 
the cod answer. Now, I had to put this slide in because uh, uh, I love the picture. Uh, it's, uh, I bought it on uh, eBay. It's a Hungry Horse Dam. Uh, it's in Western Montana. It's one, it was built in, uh, of course, 1953, it was finished. It's one, it was one of the bigger dams in the world when it was built. Of course, the reservoir, you see, is 34 miles long. It's on the South Fork of the Flathead River. Um, of course, you know that that eventually ends up in Flathead Lake. Um, it's one of the bigger lakes in North America. Um, now, it was a, this was from a thesis I got this from, but it, it quoted some very um, well-known and respected scientists. And it said, the Hungry Horse Dam releases have thermally altered the water temperatures of the river, producing, quote, extreme ecological disturbances that have significantly reduced insect species, diversity, and biomass in comparison to unaltered river segments. Uh, Stanford and Hauer, 78. In this constant thermal regime, many species of insects presumably cannot complete their life cycles. Um, Graham, Stanford, and Hauer. Um, now, before the dam, uh, pre-1953, the unregulated river temperature varied through the seasons from zero to 18 degrees centigrade. After completion, post-1953, the regulated river temperature remained near a consistent seven degrees centigrade throughout the year. Now, this study was in uh, 1960, or I think this was written in 1960, but I know they've done, they're actually doing other releases to try to solve this problem but uh this kind of is, is kind of scary because every mega dam or a large dam or this this type of flow regulation uh what is probably one of the biggest killers of biota on earth if it's killing these uh kills the insect life uh, the insect life consumes the dissolved organic carbon uh, in, in the water they feed on that uh you know there's there's a <laughs> uh you know, carbon, uh, what you call uh, loss of carbon uh, removal from the water. Um, this should be in the, this more in the discussion. Now, notice the mountains in the background. That's, that's the Rockies. And uh, this reservoir is, uh, dam is 15 miles from Glacier National Park. You remember all the humidity that was mentioned uh, in, in the Russian article. Well, th this dam, especially in the fall and early winter uh, and the river, uh, the, 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 where the river doesn't freeze, it's gonna produce a lot of humidity. What impact does that have on Glacier National Park? It, all we see is uh, articles about how the glaciers are about gone. And they really started kind of, uh, uh, you know, when the, when the dams are being built. And this dam isn't the only one that's been built in the region. So it's, uh, it's just another thing for discussion. Um, it's always seems to be left out. You know, this heat pollution that uh, Noy talked about. Hope I'm not going over my time. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, you're getting a little close. Okay, I'm well done. Um, I sort of, oh, um, yeah. Their big lie. Um, I see these uh, clean energy corridor ads. This one says, uh, Big benefits, small footprint. It's right out of the Central Maine <clears throat> Power and Hydro Quebec corporate playbook. You tell the lie uh, as many times as, as you can and long enough and loud enough, people will believe it. Um, I, I think it's interesting they use lobster traps. Well, lobsters are really affected by warmer water and thermal pollution. And uh, they may want to change their picture because uh, these, these uh, what what these mega dams are doing, um, is uh, especially you know it's not just Canada because what happens in the uh, Arctic also affects you know the Labrador Current. Um, they they may want to fish the uh, lobstermen fishermen may want to start paying attention to this. Uh, so small footprint. Well, I made a list of big uh, of the of the uh, impacts that we've learned uh, along the way about uh, the dams and uh, flow regulation. 
Um, it's not a little list. And there's some big, big impacts. Uh, this is a big footprint. Uh, some, um, some of these impacts of this big footprint that should have been included in the regulatory hearings for NECC, fishery policies, and climate change discussions. Uh, that's kind of our goal that, that this starts to happen. Um, now, uh, lastly, uh, took this picture from the, uh, took it from the Natural Resources Council of Maine, um, proposed NECC route, and there's a, <laughs> there's a transmission line going in. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't agree with small footprint here, but uh, one of the, if the, if the NECC line is approved in the November 2nd, 2021 referendum on question one, um, this is a guarantee. More dams will be built in Canada. So uh, that tra transmission line is going to equate to a lot more dams and a lot more mega damage. And, uh, there's, I'll have this, uh, the information uh, for people that they can buy the book from these, uh, from these groups. Uh, say no to NECA. Um, from uh, arcticbluedeserts.com, Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. And uh, in Canada, the, the uh, Grand uh, River Keeper of Labrador, uh, Roberta, <laughs> has some. So uh, that makes mailing a lot cheaper. And for information, uh, um, it's, a, it's a list uh, will be growing, I'm sure. Um, I especially want what's happening in Canada. They're making a uh, big... Uh, uh, they're just assembling all kinds of information. Um, this is being done with the help of the Grand River uh, Keeper up there. So we want to keep you apprised of that. Okay. Um, I guess I'm done. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate it. <clears throat> um, so, um, yeah, I think the only thing green about um, uh, hydroelectric dams are the hundred dollar bills that come out of the turbines you know <laughs> so everyone hope everyone knows hopefully they'll vote they'll vote yes uh, in in the november elections and uh uh the dams really are problematic for for being green i had the good fortune as a youngster to do some paddling with the cree up in northern quebec and it you know, it's like 50 years ago and it, it breaks my heart to think of what's been done to that province and the same thing would apply in parts of Manitoba and BC and throughout uh, Arctic Russia, you know, putting relatively warm waters into um, into the Arctic Ocean at the wrong time of year, you know. So, so we're, we're running a little bit, a little yep. bit late. So I'm not sure how many questions we can fit in, but I, I don't see very many questions on the chat. We're losing a few people. So if we want to, um, if you could field any, like a, just a couple questions of people in the audience, um, if you want to raise your hand or a gesture on your video. I have to say, if you've had a question, we can unmute you. And, and while we're waiting, I'll put in a final plug to join us the second Wednesday of uh, the month, uh, October through May. And we'll have more of these. Okay, wonderful. And is there contact, Roger, for, for if people do have questions and they want to? Oh, well, I, you know, I left that out. Uh, friends of Friends of Sebago at yahoo.com would be, uh, of course, you could also contact Ed and he could give you that information to uh, Mary Meeting Bay. Yeah, that's my oversight. <laughs> friends of Sebago at yahoo.com. At yahoo.com. Okay, I put that in the chat. I hope that shows up. And um, we do have uh, several people saying thank you. Um, that's very helpful information and more thank yous I'm seeing. So I, I think we're, we're good to go. And we wanna thank you very much, Ed. Do you have any last comments before I close down the well, just just uh, again, uh, join us next month for the for the latest on Sea Shepherd, and thank you, Martha, very much for sure. making this happen, and and Roger for yep. being our first guest with some really really valuable information, and a, 
also thank Tom Walling on our board, who while we were going to have you do this presentation, Roger, Tom made the obvious point uh, that we should do it before um, the November ballot. Yeah. Uh, ho hopefully this will help people in their decision then. So thanks, <laughs> thank, thank you both. All right, so everyone can leave and I'm just gonna end it slowly so I don't forget to do all of the jobs that I'm supposed to be doing. And, saving and, and, hope, and I will say hopefully that uh, we'll have this recording up on the website within a few days or so. Right, so. and it is live streaming on YouTube now so it is access accessible. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, stop. Stop live streaming. Stop.